white men, I'm going to speak about that, is that they they are feeling there's more than I have like three or four different male white male friends who think that they're being kept down because of affirmative action. Like they are basically the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to hiring. Well, see, I disagree oh, okay. with those people because I believe those people by virtue of being white, and maybe this is prosaic of me, have the power to change their circumstances because for so for centuries in this country, being white was it was it was it was a leg up. It was a way to get a better job, to buy a car, to buy a home, I and agree. all these things. And I just don't believe that that's completely gone away. Is your success determined more on your own hard work and drive, or you know, is it more the other way? You're more a victim of your circumstance, and no matter how how, how hard you try, that you're just you know, there's forces external to you that keep you down and that you have no control over. And what's you know, what's the balance there? How much are we really a meritocracy or not? And you know, I I think I've thought about that a lot in recent years, and. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I think it's a yes and, and it's not an either or. And I think that's kind of where the conversation is getting lost is that, you know, I think people are not allowing for the nuance that takes both into consideration, right? It's not that you've either solely worked hard and pulled yourself up by the boots, by your bootstraps, or you've had everything handed to you. I think it's, an, it, I think there has been a role for both. I know me working hard um, will lead me to different levels because of where I'm starting from and who I know and the resources that I have versus a poor kid from the hood who could be working just as hard. I mean, even starting off with, you know, schools, I went to an expensive prep school, you know, working hard at my school, like opens doors or prepares me for certain levels of university or certain levels of professionalism where like, that's not going to be the case. I'm just you know, thinking here in Chicago, I live up the street from some Chicago public schools, and that is absolutely not the case. And so I think we have to allow room for both conversations without people feeling as if either this group is playing victim or this group is, you know, completely ignoring. I mean, I thought, I think I was sharing with Andre, like, um, you know, being at my firm and, and, sitting down with even partners and other leaders at my firm and hearing them talk about the ways that they're helping their children get ready for college or get ready for internships. Like they're literally picking up like in their cell phone are our clients, which are the C-suite of Fortune 500 companies. And they're just picking up the phone like, can you help my kid get an internship? Can you help my kid? Now, of course, the kid has to do well on the internship, but like most people aren't going to be able to pick up the phone and do that. And so to call that out, doesn't mean your your child isn't working hard. They're just working hard from a very very different place, um, and there should be an acknowledgement of that. And there, and there and there shouldn't be a well. My kid is working harder than this kid over here who ends up in community college because you don't know that. Like that's not necessarily the case. So I think there has to be you know room for for nuance and to have both conversations. That it's a yes and like there are aspects of meritocracy and hard work because I always say if you don't work hard, it's going to show up somehow. Yeah. You know, um, but there is also consideration of what have you had access to along the way. Yeah. And what you've had access to for many white people is mortgages. So what I want to understand is why don't black people merit mortgages from the largest credit union in the United States, which after investigation only approved the mortgages of 48% of its black applicants in the past year, but 77% of the white ones. You're talking about the Navy, Navy Credit Union. Yes, that's what we're talking about. I didn't mention it by name, but go ahead. But we all know. <laughs> it's we out in the know. it's out in the it's out in the news now. It's yeah. Cool. I don't want no lawsuits. We all know that owning property, whether commercial or residential, is a gateway to building wealth. And yeah. sometimes it is. See, look at him, own his home, mm -hmm, got equity. And it's like me do. And and we all know that when you deny, you could be working very hard for that down payment, get the inter the lower interest rate or whatever, and then turn around and you're denied, right? And a lot of that time, and you know about redlining, et cetera, a lot of that time, 
race is a huge factor in that denial, right? Even when you, you know, account for credit scores, down payment, have you owned before, all of these things, the levels of debt you have when you apply the mortgage, apply for the mortgage. And that is a very, you, my point is that, that's why I wanted to define meritocracy because some, it's a feeling that white people merit opportunity. And we all know that one opportunity begets more opportunities, right? And so they merit opportunity, whereas Black people, by virtue of being Black and wanting to own a home, they don't merit opportunity, right? That's a prime example. You know, is you got to be twice as good to get half of what they got. Yes. And I wanted to add something in terms of credit. I know something, one of, something that has come up as of recently that I have personally experienced is the aspects of, there are aspects to one's credit score that of course that are very basic. Do you pay your bills on time? But there are aspects to your credit score and access to credit that are very subjective and that are very much about who you're around. So case in point, I learned when I was graduating from business school that there were going to be some credit card companies that offered me platinum or the equivalent of platinum cards solely based on where I graduated from school and who my friends were. Mm -hmm. And did, and like, did you know that um, it's known that a lot of um, creditors or financial institutions pay attention to your friends on social media and who you're connected to on LinkedIn because it's the birds of a feather flock together, um, sort of a thing. And so again, your access to credit can be: I went to X Y Z University, and in my LinkedIn profile, you know, it's Harvard Business School, and you know, and it's you know, my network is full of Harvard Business School alums. Will make an Amex be like. Okay. So Todd, thank you, thank you for making me look good. And that's got nothing to do with if I pay my bills on time. Why you think I'm friends with Todd? I need some white folks what? in my life to help me. Hey, hey Todd is my friend. Too. Right. <laughs> so thank you, Todd, Mr. I'm from Beverly. You linked in me, Marcus. <laughs> Not yet, but I will. Because you need, y'all better be friend that bar. <laughs> We're so, gonna go ahead and start linking in like Todd. So coming back to so coming back to this basic question. So what I hear Marin share in response to Susan's question and in reflection or elaborating on her bootstraps comment. Tell me if I get this wrong right, Marin, is the bootstraps concept is that my effort is a highly prominent, very close to a hundred percent. Obviously, I'm, no one's gonna say a hundred percent, but if we're going to talk about context, opportunity, access, whatever those words are, and effort that I put in, right, that that effort is the dominating factor in whatever that I've achieved. And you want to push back against that, Marin, and say, we all get born into a certain context. Um, and, you know, whether it's around, you know, how mortgages are doled out later in our lives, right, how credit scores are determined, or you know, land into you, you talked about how these disparities happen when you're so young, they start so early. So it could be the education context, you know, in your, in, in where you grew up, there, there's, there's all these factors. And what you want to say is, you feel like the ethos of America of this pull up by bootstraps doesn't give, you know, adequate account for those other factors that may influence where you start off in, in applying your effort. Am I hearing you correctly? around that pushback. How do you take that in, Susan, um, as it relates to meritocracy and her, her the bootstraps comment? I, I really resonate with what Marin said and the, especially the yes and framing. I love that framing um, that you can have those two thoughts in your head at the same time, that there are two two different factors to, to consider in somebody's success or not, you know. I, and I think I've evolved, I think I've changed on that over the years. I used to believe more in meritocracy. And, you know, when I was younger, I think I told you guys I read some Shelby Steele and other books and led me to believe more in a meritocracy and, you know, my libertarian beliefs. And then I think I've I've mellowed on that a bit, uh, you know, a lot over my life and and realizing it is much more of a of a mix. There is still a lot of hard work that's required. Um, but I do know that, I mean, there's I hear like um, su successful blacks, a lot of them who are more conservative are saying, you know, arguing that everything should be a meritocracy just based solely on, on your accomplishments. Um, but then I, then I wonder what kind of advantages did they have? Did they have, you know, family members that really pushed them and helped them and, um, you know, what really got them there? Did there, was there affirmative action that helped get them there? Um, so is it really just their merits? Um, so I think about that particularly um, 
Yeah, so there's some some prominent black thinkers and 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 people that wonder. I, I kind of question that sometimes. And what's the worry behind? So you know, when I when you heard what what Marin said, I heard a little concern in your question. You know, what is the concern around counter arguments to merit to the idea of merit um, to the idea that that effort is important? What you felt something there. I understand that you you have given more weight over time to context, but there's still at the same time yeah. something that pushes well, against something inside of you. What what is that thing? What's the concern around not not giving merit its due its due consideration? Well, just sort of understanding. Okay, so here's a particular story about somebody I knew very well and worked very closely with over about almost 25, 30 years. And he, he always struggled. He was a brilliant man, but always struggled with in the corporate world and just conforming and just so many issues. And finally, near the end of his career, he went to see that Dr. Amen, who does his brain scans um, about, you know, the health of your brain. And he went to see him and he showed me the report. And it turned out he'd been operating his whole life with da significant damage, damage to the front of his brain. And so... All of these things that I was so frustrated with him. Why can't you be more like this? Why can't you be on time? Why can't you get your stuff organized? Why can't you stay focused? Mm -hmm. And once I saw that report on his brain scan, I realized he can't. That part of his brain that governs that, you mm -hmm. know, controlling his behavior is just is dead. That that and so and the doctor said it was probably some point early in his life that he an illness or injury damaged his brain and he went through mm -hmm. his whole life with that debilitation that is, is not visible to anybody. Nobody exactly. knew about it. And so how many people are there? I started wondering, it really questioned my whole outlook at, mm -hmm. and thinking um, like people in poorer communities and maybe more black communities, are there things in their environment um, that people, chemicals, pollution, whatever, that are affecting brain development that can really hold them back that is no control of theirs that, you know, that, that really, that was a pivotal point, point for me in questioning, you know, why can't you just do that? Why can't you just yeah, make, you yeah. know, study this harder? Why factor. can't you just, hmm? This unseen factor. Yeah. That didn't so I, have and you... I kind of think, well, gosh, I mean, I wonder how much brain injury there is in the, in populations of people like in prison, you know, there's probably a ton of, of, of brain injury anyway. So that, that made me think of that. But then I also think on the other hand, pushing back the other way, yeah. I don't want people to blame their circumstances and just say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm screwed, you know, so I'm not, why even bother trying, you know, and, and just blame it on race or circumstances or poverty or, you know, just blaming that. So that, that's the danger to me in the other direction. So it's kind of this tug of war in my brain. <laughs> of, so when yeah, you were push, when you were questioning the, the bootstraps comment, it, that second part of your brain was saying, you worried about if we talk so much about context, then do we get more people throwing their hands up and saying, well, if my life yeah. is dictated by that context, yeah. what, what good is my effort? You know? Yeah, and just like I'm a victim and just play, you know, there's that victimology thing that people talk about. Like, you know, if you go through life thinking of yourself as a victim, you're going to manifest that in what in your life. Landon, um, what do you think of all of this? Because you're a bootstraps person, like you've shared your story. What do you think of all of this? Well, I think it starts at birth. I have four kids. Um, one of them was never academically inclined. She just didn't have the mentality of an academic person. She And she has really struggled. And my other three, like two of them, they're like, it's so easy, you know? Um, and so we live in a society that, that is increasingly technologically advanced, and that's how people make money. That's an automatic bias against a huge part of our population who doesn't have academic credentials won't be able to get that. My daughter, that daughter that I'm talking about, she tried to go to community college this year. And I can tell you, it was an incredibly difficult thing for her. She couldn't, she failed the class. Um, and you know what? I just hope it makes you think, you know, that there, that there's not only, it starts at, at birth um, and, so every human being is such is a different beast you know we're all so different and we start from different you know it starts in circumstances you know your home your community your culture i mean all of these things and some people just don't win that lottery as much mm -hmm. as other people right um and and it goes all the way up to adulthood 
And I, and I just want for her um, to have live in a society where there's still social integrity in not being one of those people with a college degree, you know, um, is there still, can you still be respected and, and feel like you're an important person in society uh, without that kind of credentialing, you know? Um, and I'm the opposite, you know, I grew up in, you know, not very good schools, but, but I had a lot of natural talent for academics, you know? And so I was able to, through test scores, not through grades, but I was able to rise up, you know, and that there was that pathway available. That's an amazing thing that, that that pathway was available. But again, like it depends on the economy and the priorities of the nation in some ways, you know, uh, how do you make money, right? Um, and increasingly, I think it's a little bit more difficult for people who are not academically inclined. What I find Lana, to be interesting, to... oh, go ahead, go, on. Go, 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 go. I was gonna say, what, when I, what I hear a lot of in, in, in what you're saying is almost like, there's this huge game of who moved my cheese, right? Hmm. And what is that? that? Can you define that? Um, just in terms of moving, um, just kind of what the expectations are and what the metrics are when it comes to success. Um, and, I, and, and depending on, in this case, who has access to it? Because hmm. I believe a lot of what we are talking about has been going on for a really, really long time, but because you know, certain people had access to higher education and everything like that. The the mantra we were hearing is, well, the people who didn't just didn't work hard enough, mm -hmm. right? Now that college and different levels of college is more accessible to a lot of different people. And, you know, now we're saying it's something a little bit different. Now, get, now getting a college degree isn't necessarily deemed your path to success. Um, even going to top 20 colleges or whatever, now that that's more accessible to more populations, now we're kind of criticizing if that's the path. It's like we're constantly moving what it means to yeah, be successful it's based not on exclusive access anymore, right? to it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how we deal with the tension of two things that I remember hearing from y'all. Um, Marin, you, you're part of your concern about talking so much about effort and less about context, especially, especially as it relates to race, was around the inferences people would make based on the inequalities that exist, right? Mm -hmm. That that it would be this is this is inherent in the black community, right? The the you know if we're going to talk about effort, right? Um, and 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 perhaps even you know natural dispositions, God given gifts, if you want to put it that way. If we're going to talk, then then if we're gonna if we're gonna go light on the context, then people are gonna make inferences about the black population, right? And they so you already do. Hair. They think we're stupid. <laughs> they do. They think they think we're stupid. But what I said is they think we're stupid. Yeah. <laughs> that that yeah. We we we're frozen we again. We're frozen again. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't mess with me, Marcus. Don't mess with me. <laughs> Marcus, you were sharing this these kind of two sides as well uh, previously when you talked about yes, racism exists, and you you're concerned about what you call the "woe is me" attitude, right? Um, you get concerned about your your big one of your big questions was when is enough enough, right? Of talking about the context, um, and I'm I, I guess I'm I guess I'm wondering around this topic of meritocracy what how do how should we approach these the, the tension between these two things how how should we approach specifically racial inequities racial disparities um when we have context and we have effort i think it's it's hard to navigate because i like i said before you have the instances when it's factual it happens it occurs but you also have the instances when it doesn't. So how do you differentiate the two? Hmm. How you do you know when it's real versus when it's not? You did so, say you did say you worry about people assuming assuming racism as a first response, and you you get concerned yes, about that. Absolutely. But what about these larger structural issues? Perhaps you know the way that let's say mortgages are doled out on average, or um, you know, any of the various things that we might have inherited, you know, as as disparities. Names on a resume. What mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. How do how do you think about those things? You know, are we when is enough enough to you? You know, um, when is the opportunity enough to you where we need to think more about the effort we put in versus what barriers might exist? Um, yeah, honestly, I think it is completely unfair um, when you look at mortgages or insurance rates or things of that nature. I think it's completely unfair because especially when you think of affirmative action, because I know there are people who believe that affirmative action should not exist. But as I said in the previous conversation, it existed for a reason. Mm -hmm. So at what point do you say that it's completely fair? Or at what point do you acknowledge that it's not? You literally had a class of people that were completely taken out of the equation. They didn't have the opportunity black people we didn't have the opportunities and so here's affirmative action but now you're arguing that there's no need for it because we've had a black president but you literally took a class of people and they have nothing look at black wall street look at the instances where you yank all of the wealth away from them and the opportunities and so we are kind of at a disadvantage if you look at it from that standpoint and so how do you come and say oh, we're completely on a level playing field. So I I really, I don't have the answer to that. Um, I don't think that it's completely fair. I don't think that we're equal in many situations. Um, So I don't know. It sounds like you're similar to your parents a little bit where you you recognize context the way that they said, you know, you you won't get as much grace, but at the end of the day, go and be a, a good person out there. Um, and so focus in on who you, what you can do as an, at an individual level. Um, even if those, even if those, you know, systemic challenges, um, based on race are there, is that, am I interpreting that correctly? That's correct. Yeah. I come from the same kind of you know, stock of people. When I talk to my parents, my parents are both open about being beneficiaries of affirmative action that, you know, they helped integrate Baylor you know, um, and things like that. And um, however, it, it's kind of a, you know, yes, speaking up about your circumstance, mm-hmm. but understanding, you know, they might accommodate that circumstance, but if they don't, you still need a game plan to move forward in place. And yeah. I think to a certain extent, that's kind of what's missing or lacking mm-hmm. that now it's definitely like squeaky wheel gets the grease. Like, if you're not going to accommodate me, then I'm going to scream. I mean, I think that's the power of social media and phones. And like, I'm going to scream until I get the grease rather than just being like, I've said something. All right. It wasn't accommodated. So here's my plan B or here's my workaround. And I'm just going to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. I I think that's that's where I can understand Mm -hmm. some of the like, okay, you know, is this the right way of going about it or how it can feel like we're talking about it too much, um, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of thing where I just think it comes down to, you know, you need to find a way to still keep moving forward, Mm -hmm. knowing that, okay, life isn't fair. It's probably never going to be completely fair. You can't let that paralyze you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but also, Marin, I wanted to give honor to the psychological exhaustion that 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 it feels like we you and I both work in corporate. We've seen white dudes fail up all the fucking time. Right. And so here you are. OK, because what I don't like about all this is that the black people always have to be moral and forgiving and all this different horse shit. And then you see these white people going out living, living their best life, not giving a damn. And here you are like, okay, I'm going to be the, the good person and do whatever. And, you know, I'm just going to say what I feel I've learned by my age. The nice guy doesn't get anywhere. It's the assholes and that they, they go out there, they create the opportunities, they make the moments and they rise to the top, Elon Musk. And so, right. <laughs> right. And so I hear all of that, but it, it's very dispiriting for a young person. So I don't want to use the word victimhood, but it is easy to reach back for those narratives from the past as an explanation for what's going on now. Mm. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, I really appreciate the, you know, hearing from you about what you think white people perceive black people of in terms of intelligence, you know, and I think that that uh, I agree with you in that that is definitely a powerful force from the past that is not fully dissipated, although I think that it is dissipating rapidly. 
Um, and I think we need to continue to do it. You know, I, I looked at, um, you know, you look at old sculptures and statues and you say, you know, like that's very degrading to see that it's white people perceiving themselves as the great, you know, helpers offering benefits to the poor, you know, to the Indians or the black people. And it's like, you know, those things don't apply anymore and they should be taken out, you know, because I see those because things have changed and they have to keep changing because, you know, and everybody who thought that, you know, there are black people are, you know, intellectually deficient, just, you know, like that was a powerful, I think, um, undercurrent, you know, through American history. And I do yeah. think that there's some undercurrent now, um, that it's lower class and middle class people are, you know, kind of th that people who are getting that undercurrent now, you know, um, because we're so focused on education. So it's okay. kind of shifting around, you know, um, but it's still there, right? And I think that it, it is correcting. I, I think I, I, I see trends where black people are getting, they have more, um, they're getting more of the benefit of the doubt to try to correct for these kind of undercurrents that have happened throughout our history. You know, I see people in companies where I at, you, they wanna hire more black people. They really are trying to hire black people and they do and this is this is important you know um so i i see that there is a, a willpower and black people are getting more power to uh say that you know this is you know you should look further if, if there's any kind of racial bias in this and that they should be able to have some more of that punching power you know um and i think that that's happening i really do i i mean i in in my industry it is you know I accept um, that. In my industry, in people I know and, and have known white men, I'm going to speak about that, is that they they are feeling there's more than I have like three or four different male white male friends who think that they're being kept down because of affirmative action. Like they are basically the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to hiring. Um, so th they, there's almost this this anger <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's under the you, surface. Yeah, where do, you, where do you put the balance of these forces, right? Like, yeah, if, if it's going toward you know, re, uh, helping you know correct the past, then there's going to be certain people who feel like losers of that kind of action, right? Um, yeah, and those are lower and middle class white people increasingly, right? Yeah, um, and, so, and and th and they're and they're angry too, right? But they don't appreciate the powerful undercurrents that shaped the past perhaps you know perhaps it's yeah it's I, but they also don't have very much power to overcome their circumstances right and so so they just so get I, angry yeah. and it's and you get populism right so that's exactly yeah that's it so you know it's it's trying to you can't make everybody but see i disagree oh, oh. with those people because i believe those people by virtue of being white and maybe this is prosaic of me have the power to change their circumstances because for so for centuries in this country being white was it was it was it was a leg up it was a way to get a better job to buy a car to buy a home I and agree. all these things and I just don't believe that that's completely gone away now I'm I'm reading this very interesting book called Super Hubs right and it's about people of influence who are basically making all sorts of decisions for us in the world and these big banks and large companies all around right. And it said the one thing that these people all share are money, influence, and information, right? And no, money, opportunities, and information. Mm -hmm. And I think for those white people who are angry, I think some of the more successful white people have stopped sharing the information of how to create the opportunities you want in your life. And I think Black people, because literally I feel that Black people have taken reconstruction into their own hands. And through our trying to just you know, get together and let's, let's build something, focus on the positive and build something great for ourselves individually and for the race, we have been very aggressive about learning the information that we need to be successful to create those opportunities, whether it's social opportunities, jobs or what. That's I don't right. know how to help the white people, middle class, and I don't want to use the word low class, but low class, that don't have access to this information. Right. I was blessed to have Todd in my life. I was blessed to have Marin in my life. Marin is the one that taught me how to code switch and, and thank God. 
Because now I know I can sit in any corporate meeting with any person, any VC fund. I know how to create a meaningful slide deck that gets to the point. I didn't, my family didn't know how to do shit like that. I had to learn that mess, right? And right. and I always assumed that white people who didn't have access to that information could just go to, you know, a white mentor in the company or wherever and learn that information. Sounds like I'm assuming something that maybe is not the case for some people. Yeah, the internet, you know, gives us, you know, if people are determined enough, the internet actually provides you with the opportunity if you can access it. But, you know, you have to get to that point where you have enough energy, determination, and also the, the, the you know, educational foundation, right, to build upon. Thank you for watching this episode of Healing Race and stay with us for a scene from our next video. If you wanna see more conversations like the one you just watched, please subscribe to our channel, share this video with friends and family, and like and comment on the video below. If you'd like to be a guest on one of our episodes and have an open, real conversation about race, email us at guests at healingraceshow.com. And if there are topics you think we should cover, we'd love to hear them. So please email your ideas to topics at healingraceshow.com. As always, thanks for your support. We look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Now, here's a scene from our next Healing Race. I hear stories all the time of people just blatantly discriminated against um, based on their race. Um, and, and it makes them angry. And in, and in some cases they're black and in some cases it's because they're, I mean, I've heard many stories of whites just like a friend wanted to be a, a friend wanted to be a firefighter. That was always his dream. And he said, you're, you're a white man, just forget it. You're, you're, you're at the bottom of the list. Um, so he wasn't able to do it. Um, and then in, in my company I worked for the last part of my career was positions would be open for a year, two years with plenty of, of non-diverse candidates supplying, but they just were re all rejected because the HR person told me secretly, we have to, we have to have diverse candidates in these spots, period. So white men need not apply. Sometimes there's diverse candidates available and not enough to, you know, accept as many as there should be. And sometimes there's not enough, right? Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, it just depends on the, the, the well, but this, the, the people who are shut out based on their race and their gender being white men, they feel it and they're angry. And I see that fueling this, this yeah. Trumpism, this populism, this, you know, it, I think it comes from a very real place. Well, welcome well, to us in the Right. To watch the rest of that episode, go ahead and click the video below me. To see a different compelling Healing Race episode, you can click the video below me. We look forward to seeing you in the next video.